Campers, it's me, Ari Lehman, the first Jason Voorhees. From Friday the 13th, I'm here with AJ, and he's got the juiciest slice ready for you. It's dripping with blood. Jason never dies. What makes a horror film kill memorable, terrific, even in some way profound or poignant? Let's explore. Thanks for checking this out. If anything about it trips your fancy, please like, subscribe, and share. Oh, yes, yes. Without further ado... We're in the glorious and awe-inspiring Rocky Mountains because it's a beautiful and evocative locale on the cheap, especially when the bulk of the filming takes place in the light of day. A young plein air painter has collected some water to swish her brushes and ascends. Twining her way through the trees until she comes upon a small clearing. For all the beauty and serenity that can be found amongst the flora and fauna, there's little leeway for mistakes out in the wild. So bringing along her tyke demonstrates the lady artist's confidence in the untamed setting, making it a safe assumption she's developed a kinship with Mother Nature and feels at home in her bountiful and boundless bosom. The unfazed tot seems content enough out in the open air confined to a baby jumper, particularly when offered a taste treat. Or, for small children everywhere, the most universally entertaining thing in all the world, a sprig of grass. That might be different now, what with toddlers better able to work phones than dinosaurs like me. But in my day, a wheat straw could get you through an afternoon. So with her baby attended to, and seemingly safe and happy enough, the lady artist remaining in her child's eyeline, returns to her canvas. She might have ADHD, she forgot her jar of pond water. No matter, she has come to this place for personal and important reasons. What should I paint? Someone, a stealthy stalker steadily closing in, has other ideas. Possibly. Okay, there's no reason for artifice or prevarication. For sure with sinister intent, the unseen figure approaches. The chillaxing little one the possible objective. But to the relief of all those with even a modicum or hint of decency, she is bypassed. For now. The lady artist might have a sense that a presence has entered their proximity. Or is only conscientious enough while painting to keep her eyes peeled, since it is the woods. Still, feels ominous. Returning to her canvas, she is only able to add a few strokes before, well, an extremely disturbed person goes berserk with a large cutting implement. Hey, that kind of looks like the art class shade of red that comes in a gallon sized jug. Well, she really is an artist, inside and out. Egregious overkill? Maybe. Effective overkill? There's no mistaking that the Berserker is some kind of barbaric beast of an individual. So a point has been efficiently conveyed. So yes, definitely effective. A few final blows end any hopes of an illustrious gallery opening for the lady artist 
and now the small child in her care is at imminent risk of becoming a delectable morsel for some kind of primal psychopath. And the scene's outgoing music proves foreboding enough to suggest whatever our worst suspicions, they're well founded. Eventually, our brutal backwoods slasher <laughs> mind bogglingly bull rushes into his well deserved and extravagant demise. and learns what it's like to be a prolific seamstress, starter, or tailor's pincushion. <laughs> and what of the tot? Somewhere nearby, she occupies herself with a hatchet, certainly in no way at risk of getting carried away by a stock footage bear. Looks like trouble. What a mad punch. It's very reductive. Oh, who am I kidding? Bears have bigger problems. Lord Jesus, maybe we can talk about bringing back Buffy the Vampire Slayer. What gets an eggs at the label of extraordinary varies, but sometimes it amounts to the role it plays in a greater horror. In this case, it also strives for a good splash of goriness to keep things competitive. After all, this was the early 80s when practical effects had made blood and guts all the rage. Whereas some strived to create an artful illusion, this one was more in the school of splash liberally to hide that no actual wounding was shown. But that's okay. Not all paintings hang in museums. Plenty hang in cheap motels, and see things that could curdle our insides and turn all our hair gray. Don't, um, ask me how I know. This collection of edited together material received but that is one big pile of shit. A lot of criticism. Considered hackneyed, doomed by poor acting, and hamstrung by too many nameless victims, unintentional humor, poor effects, a nonsensical plot, and an absurd killer with zero backstory or even a hint at his motives. This film runs the gamut of underlying shoddiness that gets a film lumped into the trash heap of garbage cinema. But even from the landfill, a flower can grow. Because even a low-budget, poorly executed, somewhat schlocky exploitation flick can strike upon a scenario that's truly blood-chilling. And the lady artist's demise accomplishes that by putting the baby into the hands of a cretinous miscreant who has been seen to kill with little or no regard for the sanctity of human life. This might be an overstep in a film seemingly doing a poor job of concealing its inspirations, forerunners, and progenitors, when in fact it was written and filmed before many of the pictures, it might be accused of ripping off and aping. For a rather standard mountain man outdoorsman slasher, it at least went for all the gusto despite the limitations, and that should always be commended even if the finished product is middling at best. Middling doesn't mean enjoyment can't be found though, and since I've always had a soft spot for slashers set in the woods, I would always defend it as a fun example of that niche of the subgenre. One thing is certain, it had a wheelchair-bound victim without Friday the 13th Part 2 having any involvement. This is purely speculation, but I suspect one film it did borrow from or pay homage to or baldly rip off was The Hills Have Eyes. From the look of the killer to his rustic abode filled with pilfered goods, to being predominantly set in the daylight, to an infant's imperilment, to the killer's vicious dispatching, the similarities are hard to dismiss. Had this made it to market faster, this gamey goof <laughs> might have become a known slasher villain, requiring a creative resurrection for a sequel, maybe even a name and an origin. But with a backstory already established, Baghead Jason. You've done your job well, and Mommy is pleased. That's a good boy reached the public first, and after that, a woodsman killer donning goofy accoutrements was comparatively too cheesy to be all that scary, even if he was a crazy-looking behemoth on a rampage. Maybe it's in that where our odious brute loses points, 
for emerging as a bit of a caricature, overwrought, exaggerated, and overall cartoonish. So much so he could have in turn served as inspiration for another caricature that appeared in The Hills Have Eyes too. Although it seems little inspiration was involved in that misbegotten sequel, Wes Craven going so far as to disavow it as a side hustle without artistic merit. That ill-conceived monstrosity rolling out a heretofore unknown beastly family member, the Reaper. <laughs> Reaper don't get food like Papa Jude. Oh no! Despite the character's late stage inclusion making not one lick of sense, was a misfire for sure. What are you talking about? The Reaper sucks. But that doesn't detract from the fact the bulky oaf fits the same mold as the wild man maniac. The pair could have made a badass wrestling tag team, I'll give them that. They could have been called the Hairy Wild Men or the Backwoods Burly Boys. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Weirdly, although everything about the Reaper was unmotivated, by virtue of having a name and being part of Papa Jupiter's feral clan, no matter how inexplicably, <laughs> He had something the Mountain Maniac didn't, an identity the audience could sink their teeth into, so to speak, a jumping off point of understanding. Therein maybe lies the problem. Our brood is a maniac without a cause, rampaging for no reason discernible to the audience beyond theft and mean-spirited psychosis. Part of what makes a slasher villain resonate is their twisted tale. Other than final exam, which only hints at motives but presents a much more realistic killer that has the air of a man playing out some traumatic inner turmoil violently on others. Oh lord. Almost all slashers utilize the tried and true technique of tying the killer to a transgression in the past that leads to a killing spree in the present, which sustains the subgenre even to this day. By offering no such framework, don't Go in the Woods Alone conceded a lot of audience investment, and therefore immersion, because an anonymous madman isn't as interesting as one with a colorful set of circumstances bolstering their murderous actions, imbuing them with scariness, and granting their crimes legitimacy and gravitas. Without all that, there's not a lot on the line. Events happening to total strangers can be compelling in a tabloid, slow down to look at the car accident sort of way, but fall short of the sustainability provided by a well-constructed storyline. The way the film plays out, it's as if proceedings are happening in real time without the benefit of info fed into a typical narrative, or hindsight gained in the aftermath. So everyone is equally clueless, and the characters, even the few with names, are remote or cookie-cutter stereotypes. This slice-of-life approach has worked for other types of films, but in this case, unfortunately, undermines the drama by leaving out the nuance, dichotomy, and details that would have been needed to be insinuated throughout, but were eschewed because of the underlying slapdash quality implicit in many low-budget horror films. I used the word artifice earlier, and that's what a film such as this truly lacks. The sprinkling of ticks. I'm in Wrong kind of ticks, but I suppose appropriate since in the forest ticks are an ever-present danger. In this instance, though, by ticks I mean the flourishes and quirks that make something relatable, resonating, and worth remembering. Well, I'm sincerely glad to hear that, for all our sakes. The film was loosely based on supposed murders of hitchhikers in the mountains. The stuff of urban myths, campfire chatter, and old-timey local folklore. And that makes sense. Spread in the manner of a mind virus, such unverifiable musings are as plotless as the film, so that they supplied a basis somewhat lets the film off the hook for being so bald-faced in its lack of world-building. It represents a worst-case scenario without the breadth of reality, but instead the restrictive framing of a folkloric retelling of such an event. Yep, that stands up to scrutiny. True crime has enlightened the world to many murders in the woods, on trails, and in other remote areas. To such a degree they seem terrifyingly prevalent, as if every hike, camping trip, or even a mere visit to a forest accessed via a secondary road 
is sure to end in the gravest results. I give us about 20 minutes before our first ass raping. From defilement to a technicolor death, when in actuality, statistically speaking, such events are for the most part few and far between. But those stories have been spread around and swirled in the public ether for so long, given shape and dimension by imagination and retelling, that coupled with the spattering of real horrors, the woods emerge as a pretty scary place in the collective consciousness, an implicit leeriness that goes back to primordial times, when we were evading cave bears, oh. and getting conceived when our mothers made the mistake of bending over. I think you're a deeply disturbed man. Thank you. The reality is that even with all it had going for it, this film does a good deal of fumbling around despite some obvious talent behind the camera. This brings us back around to the lady artist, and how she, like the killer, was underserved in the writing department. A convention of fly by the seat of your pants, spur of the moment, made on the fly horror, she's given little characterization, little to do, and few facets beyond the obvious. Good sound was likely an issue, but neglecting to give her a voice, even for logistical reasons, was a huge shortcoming. A couple of throwaway lines could have fleshed her out a little and granted her greater substance, offered insight into her marriage, her aspirations, anything. Instead, she might as well be mute. In all likelihood, also due to time and budgetary constraints, she was denied a chance to fight back. I would argue what hurts this isn't so much the sneak attack element. Many a slasher villain is struck from out of nowhere. <laughs> the cut to a white screen is an inspired touch because it implies all will be going, as it were, into the light. Anyway, what undercut the lady artist's exit was failing to give her more setup, showing Beyond the empathy embodied simply because she's a fellow human being with an urge to create and a baby in tow, why cutting her creative endeavors in life short should warrant some feeling beyond, well, that happened. This exit actually breaks an old rule of horror decorum I talked about in my last video, that young mothers for the most part are not to be put on the chopping block, certainly not in a visceral bloody way. Whatever you say, <coughs> it's good again. To all our misfortune, what cred this enduring misfire of a film might have earned for its daring do was blown by poor execution. The problem being she set upon and instantly overwhelmed without offering the audience any particular reason to care about any of it, denied a name, an identity beyond artist and mom, and a fight. She existed for the sole and singular purpose of being a notch on the kill count and represents the point at which a film like this lives up to the criticisms of its detractors by having a woman exist only as a victim. You admit it! You admit it! But I doubt any misogyny or anti-woman sentiment was intended or even considered. A variety of gory deaths on the cheap was needed, and it fit that requirement. With a tagline like, Everyone has nightmares about the ugliest way to die, the ones hired to sell this picture knew what it had going for it, and it, um, wasn't pretty. I don't have time for these shenanigans. As for the lady artist's innocent offspring, I don't know if by putting the hatchet in her hands it was meant to indicate that the baby was going to become a feral person, and eventually a psycho roving the forest. But the sad stark truth was that without intervention, the baby, between predation and hyperthermia, wouldn't have been long for the world victim to any number of the elements that make nature entropy's meat grinder. Leaving the baby's fate ambiguous is dark. Some folks have a strange idea of entertainment. Especially considering there's a father out there who already lost his wife. And had the film been a better piece of cinema, this attempt at an impactful ending may have left the audience with a hollow feeling in the pit of their stomachs, instead of scratching their heads. Not this insane witch hunt! This was a film hampered by miscues aplenty, a naturalistic presentation undercut by lack of background minutia to fill out the bones of the story, and something of a cockeyed view of the world, yet not enough Dutch angles to rise to the level of artistic value. What? I feel like Hanlon's Razor, never a tribute to malice what can be adequately explained with stupidity, applies to a lot of what I've talked about here. 
but that's not even true and probably unfair. It really amounts to an independent production going for broke with what assets were at hand to make as good of a movie as possible. The results of that aren't always great, but they are, from the standpoint of the creative spirit, efforts worthy of consideration. Even if that consideration leads to feelings as middling as the film itself. But even a so-so flick can put forward a good idea or two. Well, I've about reached the end of the rope, so I won't leave you dangling. Thanks for entertaining my meanderings. Please share any refutations, opinions, accusations, japes, or other ideas in the comments below. And please join me for whatever I'm up to next time. Bye now. Bye, creepy man. Keep it creepy. He's a weird guy.